author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Hello and welcome to another edition of Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. On today's Action Pack show, we are talking palace intrigues and power struggles in Iran. The International Criminal Court comes for Bibi Netanyahu. How household wealth is being impacted by the Biden economy and a whole lot more. Remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news, analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American constitution. With the death of Iranian President Raisi, a lit match has been thrown into the tinderbox of the Middle East. What does this mean? What's next for Iran? And what's next for the wider region? We're very fortunate to have with us national security correspondent, former U.S. Air Force pilot, former principal deputy and secretary of defense controller, Mr. Dave Patterson. How are you, Dave? Doing well, Mark. Happy to be with you. Now, Dave, this um, with President Raisi dying in the helicopter crash, a lot of people are assuming that there's going to be some kind of power vacuum. Uh, but you wrote a, a rather fascinating piece about how you, you suspect it's going to be business as usual in, in terms of repl- replacing one hardline cleric with another in a recent article on LibertyNation.com. Care to fill us in on what you think is happening there? Yeah, I think you won't see much of a change. I mean, you're going to see quite a bit of uh, of energy being expended within Iran and, and a lot of posturing. But in the end, it's going to be uh, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei who's going to make the, the decision just like he made the decision during the uh, last election that uh, put uh, uh, Ibrahim Ra- Raisi in position. And uh, it's going to be pretty much the same, I think. This is this is a a country that does not brook any sort of uh, turbulence in terms mm-hmm. of uh, the government. So um, I, I think it's going to be uh, a lot of uh, a lot of discussion, but not within Iran. Well, a lot of discussion on the pages of Western media about what reformers might be coming in, and then of course we end up with meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Now, something that. Uh, quite fascinated me is that Raisi was uh, unofficially pegged to become the next supreme leader. Uh, but that was also a role that uh, another name being floated was the uh, uh, Ali Khamenei, Khamenei's son was also a contender for that particular position. And it seems to me that especially in this region, internal conflicts and palace intrigue are are the norm. And so why haven't we seen denouncements about uh, assassinations, which, I mean, it clearly looks like a helicopter crash. And we'll get into the the particulars of the helicopter soon enough, David. Um, But why are we not seeing those kind of recriminations, which we would expect almost as par for the course? I think it's because of the control that... um... Khomeini has over the government and has over the populace. Uh, there, he just, as I said, he does not brook turbulence. And apparently, you know, as you as you watch what is uh, is said in Iran, uh, Raisi uh, pretty much parroted whatever uh, the uh, supreme leader said. And so, uh, I think that basically, what's going to happen here is that. Um, the the next the next one in line could very uh easily be uh Khomeini's son but at the same time it's going to be whoever that Khomeini decides is going to be the heir apparent to uh the deceased president okay well, let's let's talk about the 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 actual helicopter crash here because in this article you wrote, you, you really highlighted something that so few other outlets had covered. And I, I just found it a fascinating aside. I, I would have actually appreciated a, a much longer piece on this. But just to give a, a brief uh, summation here, they're essentially flying a helicopter that was older than me. 
That's correct. A Bell 212, it, uh, it was the part of the last uh, tranche of uh, Bell helicopters uh, that uh, were purchased prior to the uh, revolution in 1979. Uh, they've been kept flying lowly as many years as best they could. And it, it also shows a, an interesting set of priorities for uh, the Iranian government. <clears throat> they spend billions on arms, but can't keep their helicopters flying. And not only that, but they've chosen not to buy relatively new helicopters from either China or Russia and kept these Bells uh, 212s going. And it, it, these, are, these are Vietnam era uh, helicopters and uh, but uh, it, the civilian variant of, of the the Huey and it's just interesting that that they would choose to attempt to keep these things flying. Not not only that, it's not just that they're keeping these things flying. It's that they're using them to transport the president of the nation to. <laughs> Yeah. In, into weird mountainous regions near Azerbaijan. It's like uh, it's like putting Joe Biden in an Edsel with three <laughs> wheels, which yeah. I'm sure he'd appreciate. But yeah. the, specifically to the to this helicopter, the Bell 212, uh, it's it's designed for not for what they're doing, wasn't it? it it's it's designed just where you have to rely on the pilot's vision rather than the the, the metrics and the sensors within. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, it's basically a uh, visual flight rules only. I mean, it's not, was what they bought was not designed to fly in weather. It's not uh, referred to as IFR uh, equipped. And um, uh, it's not even clear to me that uh, they had a, a, a more modern radar uh, which would have, you know, given some indication that uh, the ground was coming up quickly. It's fa it's fascinating that we, the the Western world is dealing with uh, modern Iran. Let's call it modern Iran, present day Iran, uh, uh, and we're talking about well, they're, they're developing nuclear weapons. They've got nuclear facilities, uh, and yet they're flying technology that's coming up to fifty years old. Uh, and they don't seem to have yeah. anybody to even do do proper maintenance on it, and that they blame that on sanctions for not sending in parts for a fifty year old machine it it does it i mean it's sort of mind boggling when you think about it, but they still fly you know the f fourteens uh and they're <laughs> they're they're equally as old uh it, it it's just a an interesting uh, study in, in what the Iranians consider to be important. And um, apparently flying their VIPs around safely is not one of those, those priorities. And it, yes. you know, it, and it may go back to, you know, Allah's will. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to put you on the spot mathematically, Dave, but those 300 plus ballistic missiles and drones that they sent at Israel uh, very recently. How many helicopters could they have bought for that money? Well, they could have bought more than one. I can tell you that. <laughs> that's all it takes, which, really. That, that's all that it really would have yeah, taken. Which is, is you know, uh, I, I think that probably they could have uh, redone their VIP fleet of three helicopters or four helicopters that they have, uh, certainly. But... Um, you know they didn't and um the 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 problem uh, arose and raisi uh was the beneficiary well th there's a karmic lesson there if ever i heard one dave patterson will be right back with you after this short break don't go anywhere we dismiss history at our peril liberty nation radio with mark angelides welcome back to liberty nation we're staying with Dave Patterson, Liberty Nation's national security correspondent. Earlier in the show, we were talking about the the power dynamics in the wake of President Raisi's demise in Iran. But I want to talk more more generally about the the region, what's going on, specifically with regards to to Israel, with Hamas, and let let's kick this off, Dave, with talking about the International Criminal Court and their recent talk of uh, hauling. 
President Netanyahu up for a warrant. What's going on there? Well, I think that the uh, the prosecutor uh, for the International Criminal Court, a guy named uh, Karim Khan, uh, has of late been somewhat uh, antagonistic toward Israel, and particularly uh, after the uh, Israel's uh, uh, retribution, shall we say, on on Hamas. Now, what's what he's trying to do here uh, by asking the criminal court to swear out warrants. And it's not just for Netanyahu, it's for uh, 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 Sinwar as well. And uh, so he's trying to draw some equivalence between Israel, who suffered a an attack of, of just, just horrific uh, dimensions with the recognized terrorist organization Hamas. And and he's trying to draw some equivalence, and it's just not there. Uh, besides the fact that um, w- Western nations don't particularly think much of the uh, ICC, but they're an irritant, quite frankly, and they take up time and space. And and in this case, he, with his request for two warrants, one for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the other for Sinwar. It, again, the the international community, principally within the UN, have been trying very hard to draw this equivalence mm. in the you know humanitarian uh, world between Israel and the terrorist organization Hamas. It's fascinating because the the, the an, an ICC warrant it doesn't actually have any real power there's no real teeth behind it but as you say by drawing this equivalent it's a huge propaganda victory and by saying that these two are the same situation what they're ending up with uh, what what they're trying to paint is that both people are are criminals and what israel's doing is just as bad if not worse than what hamas is doing because that they've started well they were using up until recently the the Hamas supplied numbers of casualties, which is insane to believe the Hamas supplied numbers of casualties in the first place. Um, but is it a successful propaganda operation? Uh, it depends on on what uh, audience you're you're looking at. For the developing world, for those who like to strut around in the uh, United Nations, uh, yeah, it's. They, they they take it in. I mean, they're they're the ones that uh, believe the the propaganda. Uh, the first and second world, probably not. I mean, they see it for what it is, and you know, you have a. And it's interesting because when Karim Khan became the prosecutor for the ICC, Israel thought they were going to have a friend there because he he was considered to be you know a, a justice ideologue. Mm. He has proven not to be that. He's been he's proven to be anti-Israel uh, in in most of what he does and says, and I think that uh, his his request for the warrants is 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 really kind of of evocative. Let me let me just read you if you if I can uh, two sentences, and and it says that um, these uh, applications were committed in the context of an international armed conflict between Israel and Palestine and a non-international armed conflict between Israel and Hamas running in parallel. What he's done here is he has given Palestine a position, a sovereignty, which it doesn't have at all. It's an authority. It's an organization. It's not a country, and and so he draws again this equivalence, and, and it's just not there. It's it's not true. Yeah, as you often point out, Dave, uh, you ask people, tell me the president of Palestine. Yes, and, but as you say, this is going to be good fodder for maybe not the uh, a, a lot of the it's called developed nations, I guess, but. Y- it's certainly something that's going to be a rallying cry across universities, of course, uh, in in the West, U.S. universities, U.K. universities, and it worries me quite a lot that 
essentially that's the next generation of leadership and it does it seem to you there's, there's almost like a tipping point so when the, the current generation steps back and the new generation comes in what kind of situation will israel be in then when they ha when you have people who are assuming positions of power global positions of power but they support hamas essentially is what they're doing i mean the the, the distinction between uh supporting the palestine authority and supporting hamas is a distinction without a difference um so what situation will israel be in once these new leaders come into their own well israel is going to be in uh in a uh unenviable position because now you have you have the uneducated uh rallying you know the the unbridled emotions of 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 people and you're right it, it's not but it's not dissimilar to what we experienced back in the 1960s with uh you know the sds students for democratic society and so forth and particularly i'm thinking 1968 with the riots in in chicago but uh on the other hand i'm also reminded i don't know if you ever saw little abner the the cartoon al caps little abner but he he had a group of people that he called swine students wildly indignant over nearly everything and you know that's kind of where we find ourselves with these these people who are who are rioting and protesting and what because when you ask them what you know salient questions what does this mean or what does that mean they're totally clueless mm. they have no idea they're just kind of caught up in this revelry of the protest and and you know and let, let's let's do it to the man and uh eventually we will know of course when uh, we've got true diversity in this country because they'll no longer say, you know, do it to the man. It'll be do it to the woman or a reasonable facsimile. Um, and, but this is where we are. This is it, it's just truly madness. And, uh, and and it's what we're experiencing. There's also a concept, I think, that that uh, Americans generally, particularly conservatives, are going to have to come to grips with. And it's I, I refer to it as minding the store. You cannot allow even the most apparently benign uh, threats to democracy, to the kinds of, of uh, values that the founding fathers brought forth in this country. You cannot allow even the, uh, the, the first uh, step toward uh, tearing those values down to, to exist. You can debate it, you can, but you better be uh, smart about what the founding fathers really meant you can't be uneducated about this because if you are, then you're no better than the people you're debating who are basically clueless. So your, your tacit suggestion is a copy of John Locke's uh, two treaties of government for every student before they get admission to college. Dave, yes. Dave, Dave Patterson, thanks ever so much for being with us. Happy to be with you, Mark, always. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Welcome back to Liberty Nation Radio Talking Liberty segment. We're very fortunate to have with us Mr. Scott Cosenza, Liberty Nation's legal affairs editor. And we're discussing today the wrap up of the Trump trial in New York City. Now, Scott, thanks for being here, first of all. And Cheers, Mark. Secondly, and possibly even more important than finding out how you are today, it is. The case in New York against Donald Trump for the misfilings. This has essentially wrapped up now. The no more money is coming in. Sorry? I said the hush money scandal. The hush money scandal, as yes. a lot of people want to call it, which it's not a scandal, right? There's nothing to do with hush money. There's, there's no. I, I hush think money a scandal. casual reader of the headlines, if you didn't peel just even one layer deep, you would think that he was charged with illegally paying off somebody for something, which is totally not the case. Um, in fact, the only person who came close to kind of infringing on the law in that area, I think, would be Stormy Daniels and her lawyer, Mr. Davidson, uh, for uh, getting a little bit close to blackmail with uh, with with their early negotiations in the uh, in the thing. But no, Trump is charged with the way he uh, accounted for his uh, reimbursing Michael Cohen for one hundred and thirty thousand dollar payment he made to Stormy Daniels. 
Alvin Bragg said that instead of writing down, this was a reimbursement of a confidential payment to secure confidentiality with respect to a certain story that she wanted to talk about. Uh, instead, they just said it was for legal services. And somehow that yields criminality and a felony if you tie it into a federal crime, which Donald Trump was never prosecuted for. That's a bit complicated, but just to reiterate, it's that the, the prosecution of Donald Trump in New York State Court, which is where he is now, depends on the jurors finding that he also violated a federal law, which he was never charged with breaking. Or you could say it's just all to frustrate Donald Trump's presidential aspirations, and Alvin Bragg is using the power that he has to try to do that. That's something that I believe, but uh, it may not be true. Maybe he's somehow believing that this is an actual search for truth and justice, again, bringing charges. I think it's, is it 11 years after the uh the the uh, the dalliance alleged and six mm. years after the payoff anyway um oh that's the other thing too the accounting for the the payment was made after the election itself so that's another wrinkle in the in the plan to charge him with kind of interference well, that, with an that's election. quite a fascinating thing because and, and correct me if i've made any mistakes in my thing here so uh, donald trump is charged with first Filing the the hush money payment as a legal expense, which is a misdemeanor, and it's a state level crime. I think that's correct. Now it could be a misdemeanor, Mark, if right. he was convicted of it. Okay, sure. yeah. Uh, now the only reason that this has been bumped up to a felony charge is because Alvin Bragg claims that uh, he did it with the. It, intending the furtherance of another crime. And in this case, that crime would be to impact the outcome of the presidential election. Now, this is the part that really blows me away. If indeed Trump is guilty of misfiling this thing to impact the outcome of the presidential election, surely, unless he has a Trump Tower time machine, he would have had to have filed that paperwork before the election, not after the election, because once the election's taken place, it can't make a difference, right? At some point, it becomes difficult for me as an attorney to pretend that this is anything other than a, a political witch hunt. And this is where we are with this part of the conversation. Yes, what you said, it's preposterous. It makes no sense. The only, here's the thing, it's the only thing that makes sense when you look at the facts that have been alleged by the New York, by Alvin Bragg, who is uh, the Manhattan DA, the only thing that kind of, as you look at the case, why besides getting him politically would this man bring this charge? It is a massive expense for the office to mm -hmm. undertake. We learn in testimony uh, in Michael Cohen's uh, direct and especially his cross-examination that he stole at least $30,000, both from Trump and uh, a company called Redfinch. Basically, he said to uh, the Trump organization when they were delineating what, what they were going to pay him out for the, the, the settlement for Stormy Daniels and some other fees uh, and a bonus, he said, oh, you owe Redfin, uh, Finch uh, $50,000. So pay it to me and I'll get it to them because the CEO is a friend of mine. I want to make sure that he gets all that he's due. And then Cohen never paid it. He gave him 20 K $20,000 in a brown paper bag to the, uh, <laughs> to the CEO. And yeah, you think about this is his friend. He's supposed to be taken care mm -hmm. of. So he stole both and committed fraud, both from the Trump organization who he extracted those funds from and from the red Finch people who, they were rightly owed that extra $30,000, and he stole that uh, from them. And DA Alvin Bragg knew about that and didn't punish this theft of over $30,000, but is punishing, trying to punish, with th over 30 felonies, Donald Trump for writing down a different thing than, than what the payment was actually for. By the way, and this is the... <laughs> the, the, the extra part about it, which no one relied on. It's not like the state of New York 
needed the correct information for some issue that mm -hmm. Donald Trump was avoiding. It was just he didn't want this publicly disclosed, which is, of course, what, the, what about the payoff was about <laughs> in the first place. So there was no like, where's the victim? Right. Who, who relied on this? to their detriment, this filing of, of how money was accounted for? No one. I, I think that's an issue that uh, is really animating a, a large swath of the public, not the whole public, because there are, are many in the public who believe Donald Trump is at least guilty of something. And whether it's this or something else, they feel that he He's deserves- in seven trials. Mark, how could he not be guilty of anything? Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, um, yeah. But that's the thing that really, I think, sticks in in the clear thinkers' craw, as it were. That's what really sticks, is, is the idea that Michael Cohen admits to stealing from multiple victims, and yet the person that is, is in, the, uh, in the defendant's chair is not somebody who's admitted right. stealing. And so it kind of brings the victim, to the, the victim survivor of Michael Cohen's crime, the victim survivor of Michael Cohen's crimes. Um, it, it really brings to the forefront the idea that what is Alvin Bragg chasing here? Is he looking for is he is he applying justice equally as he sees it in his role as the Manhattan district attorney? Well, let's add this to the pile. This is the first time anybody's ever been prosecuted for for this kind of crime. So uh, it's a novel application of the law. Alvin Bragg mm. <laughs> was just moved to justice for the first time ever to apply the law this way for this particular defendant. But it has, according to Mr. Bragg, nothing whatsoever to do with politics. Well, let's let's dig it just a little uh, another one layer deep. Let's peel back that next mm -hmm. that next onion skin here now. Uh, don't, the the furtherance of the crime, which is needed to make this into a felony, was that uh, Donald Trump allegedly did the misfiling in order to keep uh, to impact the outcome of the election. It was an illegal election yeah. campaign expenditure. Sure. That's what that's what he would say. Now, the people who actually oversee election campaign finance the election and fraud. Yeah. they actually looked at this case and decided there wasn't one didn't they yes that's right so why does mr bragg know better than that entire department well because if he listens to uh and and follows the path that the federal election commission and uh the justice department took that means he would not be able to prosecute donald trump for crimes in a manhattan courtroom and take him away from the campaign trail for weeks and compel his attendance and also subject him to criminal liability. Donald Trump basically, you know, if you heard everything I just said, you might think it's preposterous and I think it is, but that doesn't mean that Donald Trump may not still be convicted of these crimes. That could still happen. So well, th that's as far as Alvin Bragg is concerned, I think it's all a win. Um, yeah. The oh, I just want to add one other uh, factual point, which is that it's not even that Donald Trump was able to deduct this expense because of how he accounted for it, and he wouldn't otherwise be able to. So there's not even like a tax component to this, which some people might think there is. This is a legitimate deductible expense, and it would have been deductible no matter how, how it was labeled. It was a valid expense for the organization. So, um, so that's the only reason why I think that, that Mr. Bragg is following, uh, you know, not, not following the, the, the guidance of the federal government and saying this is not a crime. But – if you want to play a devil's advocate, and I will, not all crimes are prosecuted. It is the burden of prosecutors to only bring cases that they uh, believe they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt and that the evidence reflects that. And so federal prosecutors may say, well, he, we believe he did do it, but we don't have the evidence to prove it. And that's why we never brought a case. So that, that's a possibility as well. Well, let, let's look at that, that burden of proof. So it's supposed to be beyond a reasonable doubt with a unanimous verdict coming down from the 12 person jury and that's yes. due to come in this week after defense and prosecution make their final arguments for the court uh one more question for you scott very quickly if i may do you think donald trump can politically survive a felony conviction if it comes to that wow that is a tough question to answer i'm gonna plead uh, no contest i have no idea i'm not a predictor like that <laughs> okay and scott casenza he pleads the fifth. Thanks for being mm -hmm. here, Scott. Cheers. Thank you, Mark. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides.
when politics and economics collide. That's what the American voter is about to find out, courtesy of President Joe Biden and his big push to sell the American people on Bidenomics. We're very fortunate to be joined by Liberty Nation's economics affairs editor, Mr. Andrew Moran. Andrew, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So, Andrew, we've been discussing what's happened to household wealth over the last few years. And I, I believe inflation is having some impact. Could you give us the, the information on that? Yeah. So if you look at the data at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, you know, they have a huge library catalog treasure trove of numbers to sift through, you know, on a rainy Saturday afternoon. So um, if you look at that nominal household wealth, this this is current dollars not accounting for inflation. It's risen by about 19 percent under President Joe Biden's first three years in office. This is driven by, you know, housing values skyrocketing, uh, stock market appreciation, if fiscal stimulus. That's 19 percent. However, real household wealth, which is inflation adjusted, is up by just 0.7 percent. That is astounding. Now, if you compare this under President, uh, former President Donald Trump, there's a huge diversion. So nominally, household net worth was up 23% in the first three years. And even after you factor in inflation, it was still up 16%. So when people ask, you know, who are you better under with president, those numbers definitely provi provide you that answer. Although 0.7%, percent that uh as one of the carrots in in Dameron, Dameron said you, you're saying there's a chance that that's a yes right <laughs> well so, if you're surviving if you're surviving in this market if you're surviving in this economy you're doing well then you know you, if you're in the, i think the other federal reserve data show that if you're in the top let's say 10 percent you know you're, you're pretty much doing well it's everyone beneath that mm. who've suffered dramatically even with higher uh, uh net worth so let's dig into this a little bit andrew um you say that this this household net worth it's a conglomeration of factors so presumably that includes your your 401k any stocks and shares you might own your the, the balance in your bank account as well yes yes yeah, yeah. Uh, everything that 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 uh, federal reserve statistic counts for absolutely everything that you own in your life okay, minus so, liabilities so that also includes then the the value of your home right yes so yes. that that one really strikes me as fascinating because Although everybody's better off by 0.7% adjusted for inflation, um, the reality is that it, it's, it's at a position for the, the housing market, I believe, where you can sell okay and you'll make money, but then if you're trying to actually live somewhere after that, you're going to be hurting. Is that how it works? Yeah, it's quite fat. It's 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 uh it's funny you talk about that because I spoke to an economist uh, for for uh, for the story and uh, he was talking about the wealth effect and the wealth effect is when you know everything seems to be doing well your stock your your portfolio is up your housing prices are up everything is doing well and this forces you to start spending more because you think the economy is doing well. However, because inflation is so bad right now, it, it mitigates that entire wealth effect that it, that basic behavioral economic three th uh, theory tells you so you know even if you have higher uh, high house uh, home valuations in this climate it's it's eroded by guess what rising interest rates of course however if you if you bought a home at the beginning of the pandemic or you refinance at the beginning of the pandemic at a three percent mortgage rate then of course you're sitting pretty for the rest of life you can you can hang your feet up and say ah, i'm done now because my home price is only going to go up because uh, mm. the housing affordability is not going to improve whatsoever because you still have a housing shortage. You need about 6 million new homes to restore some semblance of affordability. So if you're a homeowner, of course, and you got in the 3% range, then you're, then you're okay, in my opinion. So what's th this number you mentioned, the 6 million new homes that are needed, that's to, to cater for the, the demand for new homes, presumably, and not just to have a, a surplus, but to, to just meet what's already required. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, I, I, it is slightly off topic, but the United States is letting in quite a lot of new people every year, and they've got to live somewhere. Uh, yeah. So is it 6 million, or if we're, are we counting the, the new arrivals, as Joe Biden likes to call the illegal immigrants? Because so, they've okay, got to live so, somewhere, right? Yeah, and okay, so let's... Only so far you can pay for them to have hotels in New York City, right? 
Yes. So, okay. So, so this is interesting. You're talking about this because of this 6 million figure, this comes from, I think the national association of home builders, they testified in Congress last year. And I don't think the report uh, counted the, the invasion of illegal immigrants at the Southern border. I think they just, they just accounted for, you know, the current population, then, you know, an estimate of population growth, but with this population growth, they, they typically don't include illegal immigrants because how could you accurately forecast that? But at the same time, I would say that when you went, whenever you hear president Biden or even Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell, they constantly say that one, uh, inflation is not as bad because of growing immigration. And they, I think they skew between illegal and illegal. Mm -hmm. And then President Biden says, oh, the economy is doing so well because of this uh, an influx of immigration the U.S. is experiencing. So uh, it's 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 a give and take. It's uh, they try to they, they, they try to skew the subject. But I think your question is worthy worthy of an answer because you know, let's say for example, the Congressional Budget Office they had they were they released their economic review and they say that the economy will add about you know i think a trillion dollars in gdp because of growing immigration now whether they factor legal illegal or legal or not then that's hard to uh, determine but i know jp morgan chase they factored in illegal immigration in one of the research notes a couple of months ago and they said the same thing that economy is going to grow because of the uh, number of people entering the country legally and illegally so let's say these six million homes or six million new builds get built then they get taken up pretty much almost immediately, right? That's just to deal with the current, yeah. current demand. Mm -hmm. What is the price going to be like for both the overall cost of housing, but also for borrowing the money to get the house? Because, because nobody's really buying houses for cash nowadays, unless you're, unless you're BlackRock. You're not buying houses for cash. And I don't even think or they use their own cash. Or, or you're, you're a victim of special assessments, at, which, you can t which you can read on LibertyNation.com, of course. Well, prices are, are only going to go up. Uh, I, I don't know the exact estimates, but I'm sure. But they're only going to rise because of of uh, the demand will strengthen. And when it comes to borrowing costs, now that's that's a bit trickier because mm -hmm. uh, the consensus right now among the Federal Reserve is that interest rates will be higher for longer because inflation is sticky and stubborn and pro progress had stalled. So when you have six or seven percent of mortgage rates, that's probably gonna be the norm for at least the, the next year. Because the net, I mean, even when the Federal Reserve cuts interest rates, it's going to be a quarter point, and that's not going to do much. However, with inflation the way it is, and how it's mirroring the pattern of the 1970s and 1980s, the Federal Reserve cannot cut interest rates. It just, it just can't. So you're going to still have the the benchmark five percent, and then you still have the Treasury yields at you know yielding five percent, and then mortgage rates at around six or seven percent. So let's say if we have a somebody takes out a mortgage for six percent. And then the housing market takes a dip because at some point it has to. There's a good chance that people with a high interest rate could end up in like a negative equity position, mm -hmm. couldn't they? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you, they'll be underwater, no doubt. And how does one get out of that situation? Do you just have to, to ride it out until they, they turn around? Or because well, you're yeah, paying money yeah. into a property, but you're not gaining any extra equity in that property. Yeah, absolutely. Either you weather the storm or the bank's going to, you know, demand more at more upfront cash or you have to dump your 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 home on the market like you saw during the global financial crisis 2000 2000 what 2008 now. Oh my god, that's oh my god, that's 15 years ago. But uh, yeah, so yeah, it will be it'll be similar to that or uh to to reference my other our article I just mentioned the special assessments, you saw people just dumping their their condominiums in Florida on the market at a sharp discount and um you know, lost a lot of money based on these uh, egregious special assessments based on Florida law. Bidenomic Street and Bidenflation Avenue intersect. Andrew Moran, thanks ever so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And that's about all we have time for on this week's edition of Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network from our flagship station in the nation's capital, WWRC. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. I'd like to thank our guests. Dave Patterson, Andrew Moran, and Scott Cassent have taken the time to join us. And most of all, I'd like to thank you at home for taking the time to tune in and listen along every week. Thanks for being here. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides.